Hello, uh, and good evening from uh, Hyde Park in Chicago. My name is Chris Wheat. I'm executive director of the Stiegler Center for the Study of the Economy and the State at the University of Chicago Booth School of Business. Uh, today, or, or this evening at least in Chicago, we're hosting a conversation on China's leadership transition with professors Meg Rittmeyer and Victor Shi, moderated by Su Lin Wong of The Economist. This is actually the fourth installment in the Stiegler Center series on China's political economy, discussing with scholars and experts from around the world the country's changing political economy environment and the potential domestic and international implications. You can find all the previous events on our YouTube channel. As you can guess, our, the timing of this evening's event is quite intentional uh, given the closing of the Chinese Communist Party's National Congress this past weekend, and we know that we have a lot to cover. Um, before we begin, please note that we are on the record. We will post uh, this event video on our YouTube channel uh, later on. Um, we invite you to submit questions via the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screens, but we will likely hold questions until later or closer to the end of the discussion. And as usual, the views expressed uh, by our guests and our moderator are their own. They're not the views of the Stiegler Center or the University of Chicago. Um, I do want to highlight our upcoming webinar on populism and economics in Latin America on November 14th, uh, featuring alumni of the Stiegler Center's Journalists in Residence program. So please check out our website for more details on that program, as well as our publication, promarket.org, and subscribe to our Capitalism podcast. The relevant links can be seen in the chat function at the bottom of your screen. And now uh, let me very briefly introduce our speakers. Meg Rittmeyer is the F. Warren McFarland Associate Professor in the Business, Government, and International Economy Unit at the Harvard Business School. Her expertise is in the comparative political economy of development in China and Asia, as well as China's role in the broader world. Her first book, Land Bargains and Chinese Capitalism, and a forthcoming book project investigates the relationship between capital and the state and globalization in Asia. Victor Shi is Associate Professor and the Ho Mu Lam Chair in China and Pacific Relations at UC San Diego. He's the author and expert on the politics of Chinese banking and fiscal policies, as well, on China's, as well as on China's elites, on which he maintains a large database of biographical information. His most recent book uh, published this year is Coalitions of the Week, Elite Politics in China from Mao's Stratagem to the Rise of Xi. Our moderator today is Su Lin Wong. She is the, econ the Economist China correspondent focused on society and politics in mainland China and Hong Kong. Previously, she was the South China correspondent at the Financial Times and a correspondent for Reuters. She is also host of the Prince podcast focused on Xi Jinping, which launched September and explores Xi's ascent and its implications. Uh, I would encourage you, as soon as you are done listening to this week's uh, Capitalist Podcast to uh, binge listen uh, to that one. And without further ado, uh, I will turn it to uh, Su Lin. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Chris. And it's great to be here. Uh, it feels like a real moment uh, after this very significant party congress. And so I'm excited to just get stuck into the discussion. Uh, and so I'll hand over to Victor to make some opening remarks. Great. Uh, thank you, Suleen. Uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for joining us here. Um, so I'm just going to quickly go over some of the uh, elite political dynamics um, that we are seeing from the 20th Party Congress. Obviously, you know, to pretty much everyone's surprise, including myself, um, all the new members of the Politburo Standing Committee are firmly in Xi Jinping's faction. Uh, three new members of the Politburo Standing Committee, which of course is the highest governing body of the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, three new members were his personal secretaries. Um, so Cai Qi Li, um, was his secretary in Fujian, Li Qiang was his secretary in Zhejiang, and Ding Xuxiang, of course, his secretary in Shanghai. Uh, and then the other two people, Zhao Lezi, who already was in the PSC, and then another new member, Li Xi, um, who was the Guangdong Party Secretary, I, I guess still is, uh, but now Paul Biro Standing Committee member, uh, they're kind of family friends of Xi Jinping. 
um, they are related to people who had been friends with uh, Xi Jinping's father, Xi Zhongxun. Um, so all uh, five of these people, I would say, are people whom he had known for decades and decades, uh, and, and so whose loyalty he counts on absolutely. Uh, the one person who is not in that category is Wang Huning. So Wang Huning, of course, a very famous academic uh, in China, uh, advised the previous leaders of China, Jiang Zemin and then Hu Jintao, uh, but apparently has earned Xi Jinping's tr trust uh, and is giving some good, you know, apparently good advice because uh, his term in the Politburo Standing Committee was renewed. Uh, another reason, political reason for why he got to stay another term in the PSC, uh, even though he is of the same age as two people who were um, kind of expelled or voluntarily left the Politburo Standing Committee. Um, Li Keqiang, Wang Yang, and Wang Huning, they're all 67 years old, yet uh, Wang Huning is the lone person who got to stay. Uh, the reason could be that uh, he has a very small faction, he's very weak, so he poses no threat to Xi Jinping. Um, so that might be another reason why he got to stay. Um, so, you know, uh, I think one big implication of this lineup is that course correction for policies, especially policies that Xi Jinping himself ordered, uh, would be incredibly difficult uh, because basically everyone in the Public Real Standing Committee uh, today got there only because of uh, Xi Jinping's promotion of them. Uh, and and of course, they've made the career, most of them, I would say, except for Wang Huning, uh, possibly, most of them made their careers uh, by agreeing with Xi Jinping and by supporting Xi's position no matter what. And so they're not going, going to change their behavior now that they've you know, ascended to the top. Uh, they will stick to it. And in fact, even if one of them, uh, let's say, you know, she makes a policy decision and ends up being kind of a disaster or, you know, not not very great. Even if one of them, you know, um, speaks up and say, no, 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 this is very bad policy with the change. Um, the other people may accuse this person of trying to undermine Xi Jinping's agenda. Uh, you, you sort of saw this dynamic in the, in the mid to late Mao period. Um, and so given that possibility, no one is going to speak up <laughs> against Xi Jinping's policies. And so potentially bad policies can continue. Uh, very quickly before hand handing things over to Meg, uh, economic policies, you know, there's more talk of higher welfare uh, policies, um, this kind of readjusting uh, regulations on wealth is very interesting wording in the political work report. Uh, not sure what that means. I, I do think some kind of new tax policies are coming down the pipeline, uh, in addition to, you know, encouraging uh, wealthy people in China to to donate, you know, money to, to various charities. Uh, I do think there's going to be some pressure uh, on the taxation front. Uh, but, you know, Meg is the expert here on, on wealthy people in China. So let her say more about that. Uh, housing policies, the the you know pretty strict uh, policies on on housing, they are being relaxed already at the local level. But in the uh, political work report, there was still wording on uh, stating very clearly that housing is to live in, not for speculation. Um, so they can't abandon those policies completely, especially in the first and second tier cities. Um, and then finally, you know, I think uh, this kind of lineup. And the fact that he's serving a third term is going to introduce a lot of uncertainties on in the medium term. So in the short term, you know, everything is uh, very stable. You know who's the supreme leader of China, it's Xi Jinping. Um, as long as he stays healthy, um, there's no doubt as to who's in charge. Uh, his orders are gonna be obeyed. Um, and maybe even his very extreme orders, you know, even if he orders something that's uh, way, way extreme, uh, very different from the status quo, um, the entire bureaucracy, the entire party is going to stand behind him. Uh, so that does, um, you know, create a sense of stability. But in the medium term, uh, as he ages, and, you know, of course, he's, he's a human being, uh, although, you know, obviously he's still relatively young, you know, compared to other global leaders, including Joe Biden, he's 10 years younger than Joe Biden. 
Uh, but let's say in 10, 15 years time, um, as uh, kind of, you know, expectation of him stepping down from power at some point increases, uh, then I think, you know, a lot of interesting politics can emerge, you know, because then some of these younger officials may imagine themselves to be the next leader of China. There's very intense jockeying. All the things that um, basically you saw in the late Mao period, uh, which I sort of outline in my new book, uh, could play out um, in Xi Jinping's China. But that's sort of 10 years down the road. Uh, I'll stop uh, here. And, and um, I'm very interested in what Mag has to say. Thanks so much, Victor. So much to unpack there. Hopefully we'll be able to get into more detail in the discussion about information flows, sees economic policies, housing policies, and all that uncertainty in the medium term. Meg, I'll hand over to you. Great. Well, it's a pleasure to be here with Victor and with you, Suvin, um, and all of you. So thanks for having me. Uh, so Victor is our elite politics specialist, and I tend to work on, yes, rich people, but also kind of the structure of the economy. So. Um, let me just start by saying overall, it's really quite clear that we're in an era of political imperatives um, being kind of much more important than, than growth, which is less of a concern than it has been. And so we saw a, a pretty obvious lack of economic you know, reform discussion in Steve's speech. I think Reuters counted, he mentioned safety and security like 89 times or something, which is a, a big rise from the past and reform um, as, as a word was mentioned less, much less often. Um, and it's not a surprise, right, that, uh, that we see national security and the idea of you know, safety and security of the nation um, as emphasized relative to growth. Um, over the last decade or so, we have seen this shift in the model in China um, from a kind of traditional or, or a more familiar model of state capitalism that we see practiced in other places um, to something else. And so that 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 old model was a kind of um, the old Chinese political economy has a kind of relatively free hand for the private sector that's kind of neglect of you do what you want. And as long as you're generating growth, that's fine. Um, the state control was reserved for what we call the commanding heights. So ownership of um, and state ownership and kind of large strategically oriented firms. And then the rest of them were sort of left to their own devices. And then the emphasis has been economic growth you know, welcoming entrepreneurship, even big business, welcoming multinational corporations. Um, and that shift over the last 10 years has been away from that model to what co-authors of mine, and I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of work I've been doing with Margaret Pearson from the University of Maryland and Kelly Tai from the University of, or from the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology to what we call party state capitalism, um, which emphasizes that the party state's role, right, is the most important thing and politics are in command of economics. And so uh, for those of us who are trained in Chinese politics and Chinese political economy, it's a, it's a sense of a reversal of, of Deng's sort of emphasis on pragmatism and practicality over ideology. So now it's politics and command. Um, and so, you know, that's not, that didn't happen this last week, that happened over the last 10 years. Why did it happen? Um, and it happened for, for a lot of reasons. There's no kind of sudden shift. It was a cumulative kind of evolution of the model um, and a sense of domestic threat and international threat motivated uh, the party state to really offer itself as a solution to the problems of markets and the problems of globalization. And so domestically, there was an, an idea that the model of economic growth was unsustainable, particularly after the global financial crisis and then after the aftermath of the global financial crisis, which saw um, you know, China, the, the, the policies were to kind of shift massive amounts of investment into infrastructure uh, through SOEs, which generated uh, a tremendous amount of debt in China, both corporate debt, as well as um, debt for local governments in China and this kind of massive infrastructure model, um, which was absent, you know, what, the piece of that that was missing was consumption driven growth. And we've been saying the same thing and uh, Chinese policymakers have been saying the same thing since the 1990s, we're too reliant on investment. We're too reliant on export driven growth. It needs to be domestic innovation and domestic consumption. Um, and it's important to mention here that Xi Jinping, the Xi Jinping of, of 10 years ago, right? So I remember at the 18th party Congress, right? When the emphasis was all about, you know, Xi Jinping is going to come in as a reformer and markets will be the decisive force in allocating resources, which was the, the, the tagline, right? Or at least the ones that, um, the, the, the part of the speech that everyone heard um, in, in Western financial markets and even in Chinese financial markets. And he did attempt a lot of economic reforms, right? So there was a, a shift of focus to the equity markets in China, the idea that it should be private sector firms that are getting capital and they should raise that capital through equity markets. 
there was a push toward internationalization, pushing Chinese firms abroad, both with the Belt and Road and with kind of pushing them to make technological acquisitions and participate in these global supply chains at a higher level of, of value add than they had in the past. Um, and so uh, the problem with some of these reforms, including supply side reform, right, is that um, each one of them, and Dan Rosen um, from Rhodium Group has a, a, an essay in Foreign Affairs, which he puts this really nicely, which each one set up a sort of mini crisis in its own way. Um, so once you, once you have markets to allocate resources, then sometimes there's some disruption that goes through that, right? Because markets exercise discipline when they work. And so discipline means firms that are unproductive have to exit and you know, asset prices that are inflated have to come down. Um, but the CCP doesn't like to tolerate that kind of instability that's inherent to market rule. And so these many crises always ended up with the CCP taking control through bailouts, through using um, what I think of as the coercive part of the party state. So, you know, firms would not really go bankrupt, the, the state would rescue them, but the managers of the firms would find themselves in jail. <laughs> so this, um, mark, not market discipline really, but state discipline. Um, and then, so externally, there has been, and this has been the emphasis of a lot of coverage of China recently, these fears of foreign dependence, right, which, um, which have, been, have been there for a long period of time, but were really amplified very early in Xi Jinping's um, term in 2013, 2014, with the Snowden revelations that the U.S. had been using its dominance in supply chains to insert back doors into chips and spy on Huawei and these kinds of things. And so, um, so China, Chinese leaders really had this fear that if they depended on the West for critical inputs, right, critical supply chain inputs, especially high technology, foreign mainframe computers, those kinds of things, um, that they'd be vulnerable to the weaponization of those things. And so ironically, what we see right now is the materialization of those fears in the worst possible way, uh, which have you know, kind of resulted from what China has done, right? So the solution to a lot of that in 2013, 2014 was uh, a set of industrial policies, which um, you know, are, 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 are called Made in China 2025, which shifted state investment out of this commanding heights, just the state-owned sector, but all through the Chinese economy. So at this point, if you, if you look at the corporate structure of almost any firm, right, no matter who really owns it um, in a strategic sector, you can trace that up and find you know, the state as a minority shareholder in, in those firms, right? And so that financialization of the state's role was coupled with what we see this massive new suite of, of, of legal of laws in China. So a national cybersecurity law, the national intelligence law, the national security law um, that applied to Hong Kong, et cetera, which all give the, the state a really wide legal framework to commandeer the assets of firms. Um, to require them to assist with national security issues. Um, and so, you know, we don't know, of course, how those laws are used. It's not as if it's declared publicly, but the fact that they exist and the fact that the Chinese state can be found in the corporate structure of these firms has really alarmed foreign governments, especially the United States and OECD developed countries, right, to say we no longer can trust Chinese firms. And so in trying to kind of overcome this reliance on foreign supply chains, right? They've, they've kind of scared their partners in ways that have shut them out of foreign supply chains and indeed provoked the West, um, although it's, it's sort of many, many sides fault, um, but provoked the West into indeed weaponizing those supply chains. And so um, in a paper that came out today, I think um, in international security, my co-authors and I talk about this as being a kind of security dilemma dynamic whereby China tried to make itself safer and in doing so it made itself less safe um, by only stoking the fears of other countries and these kinds of back and forth maneuvers we're seeing all the time from, from, from the US and its allies in China. Um, and so now we're in a position where we got a speech from Xi Jinping, which was much less about growth and optimism and much more about stormy seas and, you know, weathering bad weather and, you know, trying to hunker down and focus on national security. Um, and so the question, which, you know, I, I think we'll probably discuss more is, you know, is this model likely to generate growth, party state capitalism? And in a word, no, is my view. Um, so there are a lot of structural problems in the Chinese economy, none of which are very surprising to Xi Jinping and the new leadership um, that have to do with debt, that have to do with the allocation of resources, that have to do with China's population structure and what's likely to happen um, in the future. And we don't really see evidence of any plan to deal with that, at least in the short, in the short term. Um, the reforms are stuck, even gone from the agenda, although, 
you know, Victor mentioned some interesting tax reforms on the horizon. We saw something, you know, just recently on um, tax reforms and kind of credit access for really small scale entrepreneurs, kind of like mom and pop, shop, mom and pop shops. And so, um, so that is interesting, right? It's not impossible that we'll see these kinds of things. Um, but we also see, you know, big business in China and the private sector as the enemy. Um, so the idea that the, the CCP does not really trust big business anymore, um, the large conglomerates for sure, it doesn't trust real estate firms for sure, it doesn't trust the big tech firms, we've seen a lot of that over the last several years. Um, and, you know, and, and so those dynamics aren't ones that really lend themselves to a lot of growth in, in China. Um, and so we'll still see money going into strategic sectors, but how that's going to be used um, is a different set of questions. Um, and, and so lastly, just before um, seeing what questions um, you and others have, I want to emphasize that it's just because the state seems to want to control all firms in China, or at least firms at the commanding heights or strategically oriented firms or firms of size, um, and just because it has the legal basis to do so, or even just because it's a minority shareholder, it doesn't mean that it does, right? Um, and so there's a lot of ways in which we think, you know, Xi Jinping is, control of is in control of everything, or this new model puts the state in control. But there continues to be a lot of activity in the Chinese economy that has nothing to do with what the state's doing. So again, small scale kind of stores and small scale commerce. Um, but we also see a lot of subversion of the state's interests. And so capital flows out of China, people trying to leave China, and that's been um, consistent really over the last several years. And so um, we also see a lot of the industrial funding for Made in China 2025 going to fraudulent kind of efforts. And so, um, you know, very creative um, entrepreneurs of a different sort and, and the Chinese economy who are figuring out how to use those things. And so I just don't wanna leave anyone with the impression that in fact, Beijing does control all of the Chinese economy. It's anything but, right? And so that misalignment of interest between the private sector and the state is likely to have some lasting consequences and not be easy to solve in the short term. Thanks, Meg. Wow, that, there's a lot there. And I'd really like us to get into more detail about, you know, what's the future of economic growth in China. But before I do, I guess all of us know that politics and economics are inseparable. So I might just ask my first few questions. Um, I, I might just focus on politics uh, for a little bit and then we can get into more of the crunchy economic discussion. Uh, neither of you have mentioned Hu Jintao. I was just wondering if you could both... Um, talk a little bit about what you made of those extraordinary scenes I mean there's been a lot of coverage do you think the coverage has been rubbish is there any way we can know what was going on like if you could just um share some thoughts about how you think we should be thinking about what we saw at the closing ceremony over the weekend um Victor I'll go to you first uh, yeah, sure. You know, part of why we didn't talk about it is because we probably both talked about it like 50 times this weekend already. No, I'm just joking. But actually, I, I, uh, my views on this has evolved over the past five days or whatever. Um, you know, at first I was really focused on him, on Hu Jintao and, you know, like what motivated him and, you know, um, to, to cause, kind of a no, I don't want to say a scene but you know a bit of a disruption to the proceedings and then the reaction and stuff um and who knows right and, and we may never find out you know was, was he really you know having a health related episode or was it because he looked into the red folder when he wasn't supposed to um all that is possible but to me now I think the most telling thing about the whole episode is how other people reacted, right? So you had Li Zhanshu, who uh, of course just stepped down from the Public Real Standing Committee because he's one of the people who retired, but still a very senior official. He is still the chair of the National People's Congress um, as we speak now, trying to help, trying to intervene somehow in what Hu Jintao was doing. And then Wang Huning pulling him back, right? Pulling his coat, um, forcing him to sit back down. Then um, you had uh, Hu Jintao on his way out, um, you know, tapping Xi Jinping's shoulder, and she, of course, barely acknowledged him. But then Li Keqiang, you know, a person whom he promoted personally from a lowly official to, you know, the premier of China. Uh, also barely acknowledging him, you know, a little bit more than Xi Jinping did. And then Wang Yang, uh, 
Uh, and then down the line, you know, some of these officials in the Politburo who also were cultivated by Hu Jintao personally, they all pretended like nothing was happening. So to me, it's something you say, wow, you know, you can blame them. Say, oh gosh, you know, they lack humanity and so on and so forth. But I think it really speaks to the political atmosphere that is developing in Beijing, which is that this clearly was a very political event. And people, even very senior, we're talking about the most senior officials in the regime, right? Were so afraid of making a political mistake that they did not help Hu Jintao. They did, they hardly acknowledged what was happening because of this fear. And, and this is the kind of fear that we haven't seen since Chairman Mao's time, actually. So now I'm actually focused on the other people and not so much because, you know, why did Hu Jintao, you know, and all this whole thing, we can keep guessing and guessing, you know, and I guess like incorrectly, you know, five different versions over the weekend. Uh, but we do know how the other people reacted, you know, that we know. Yeah. And it's just, you, you know, if, I, if I'm thinking about my former boss suddenly falling ill, you know, your instinct is not to just sit there stony faced. So I, I agree that that those other people's reactions were very telling. And also the fact that, you know, Hu Chunhua was demoted and, uh, you know, other people from Hu Jintao's faction were, you know, sort of retired. Meg, did you have anything to add or um, if not, uh, I was also wondering if you have any views on the lack of women on the Politburo. I'm not sure I have much to say about either of those things. Um, I mean, I don't, <laughs> to be slightly radical, the lack of women in leadership meant most all, all places always surprises me. I can't believe we're always where we are in 2022, but I don't think China's alone. I wanna hear your views on that. <laughs> We've all heard um, so much of your wonderful podcast recently. So, um, I mean, I, I'm, I'm curious what you thought of the Hu Jintao affair. I mean, I was I was just surprised. I was just so surprised. And I, you know, I'm, I'm still processing it in many ways. But I also think of that era as such an open era in China relative to what we have now. And so it was sad to see. Um, but but I'm more interested in your views on both the gender, the gender and the, the Hu Jintao episode. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's ironic. Oh, it's it's really telling that we look back on Hu Jintao's years as like the, the glorious open era of, of China. Uh, yeah, I, I've found it shocking um, within our Economist China chat, we were all like watching the video on repeat, slow-mo, trying to find as many angles as we could. Uh, but yeah, similar to Victor, it's we'll never know probably, um, you know, what exactly happened. Uh, but uh, I think given what has happened to the Communist Youth League and Li Keqiang and Wang Yang and Hu, Hu Chunhua, all of that, um, is sort of very telling about the current state of politics in China and that, you know, it's now all about Xi Jinping's guys and there's one dominant faction and that's the Xi Jinping faction. Uh, but beyond that, it's it's very hard to sort of say anything else uh, concrete. And then on women, uh, just very briefly, I was really surprised as I was reporting out the Prince, this podcast series I just put out, um, that there were quite a few candid interviews just publicly available of uh, Peng Liyuan, Xi Jinping's wife. And she's pretty frank about, you know, what what she was looking for in, in a husband. And she talks about how she wanted like a, a, an ambitious driven man with lofty ideals and a man who could control her and who could tame her. Uh, and so I thought that was um, an insight into Xi Jinping and Peng Liyuan's relationship. But then also given what sort of Xi Jinping has done over the past 10 years in terms of policies towards women. We've seen him crush all aspects of civil society, including feminists, but but also this like real encouragement to sort of have women stay at home, get married, have babies, um, seems to sort of have also influenced his, his attitude at the very, very highest levels of the Chinese Communist Party. As you were saying, it's, it's always been appalling how few women are on the Politburo. But I mean, now to have, for the first time in a quarter of a century, to have not a single woman is also uh, sending a real message. Um, so well, maybe, I mean, sorry, really go ahead. Quickly, just Meg, I did want to ask you, because you did a lot of research at the municipal level, 
I mean, are women marginalized also at the municipal level? Because some of the data that I have seen suggests that the problem uh, with women in the party is that they um, don't get to hold important positions at every level. So then you don't find many of them at the top because you, you need to hold these very sensitive, powerful positions at a lower level in order to move up to higher levels. I, but I don't know if that's correct. You know, but uh, you have better data than me. That was my impression. But, you know, it's interesting. My, you know, for 10 years, I was working on local governments and that kind of stuff. And then for the last seven years, I've been working on big corporations, like big financial corporations. You see all kinds of women at the commanding heights of industry and finance in China. I mean, I don't want to name their names and get them all in trouble, but I can think of, you know, I mean, all, you know, the chair, the former chair of the China Exim Bank was a woman, right? I can think of a, a, at least a half a dozen household names in China in terms of women in, in the financial sector. And so, I mean, what, it is very interesting, you know, and, and I've had scholars of gender from China say things to me like, you know, actually the status of women has been reversed during the reforms because, you know, as the, you know, life has become busier and markets work, right? You have a, basically a diminishing role of, of women in, in public. But I think there's a real mismatch in China between the kind of women that are powerful in the private sector versus what happens in the public sector. And Suen, you know, your, your comment about, and I remember that part of the podcast, it was very interesting. And your comment really reminds me a lot of, you know, what people are thinking about in China right now with the structural dynamics is comparing it to Japan, right? So Japan's lost decades being the slow turning debt crisis um, and structural population problems. And constantly over the last 20 years in Japan, they've been trying to get women to both have more babies and join the workforce, right? Which is a super hard, trust me, I know, a super hard dual task to have, right? And so, um, so it is interesting that you see China wrestling with this, right? Because, um, and, and, and I don't know what they're going to do about it because the, the solution, you know, the pro-natalist solution kind of runs right up against the structural economic solution, which is to have more women in the workforce to generate more participation and more economic growth. And so, you know, whether they'll be able to thread that, I mean, it, it doesn't look very promising given the political makeup, right? Um, but it's, but it's a really interesting thing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh I wanted to follow up a little bit on what you were saying, Victor, towards the end of your opening remarks on how there are a lot of uncertainties in the medium term. And you referred to the information flows, but I was wondering if you could also talk a little bit about uh, expertise at the highest levels of the party. I, I, it seems like there's lots of people who have backgrounds in defence and technology on the Politburo uh, and uh, also, if you could talk a little bit about succession, and then I'd also be uh, very keen to get Meg's views on, you know, the extent to which now the economy is sort of expected to serve the, the party. But but I'll first th uh, turn to Victor. Uh, yeah, so <clears throat> one of the biggest changes uh, we're seeing is that I don't think there's anyone, uh, even at the Politburo level, uh, with any sort of deep economics expertise. Um, so in the previous Politburo, you had Liu He, of course, you know, became a major force. Uh, and before that, you know, Wang Qishan. Wang Qishan, you know, of course, trained as a historian, but, you know, he had worked in finance, you know, through most of his careers. And he was very active and he hung out with a lot of economists in the 1980s uh, in these reform institutes, uh, etc. cetera. Um, you know, on the other hand, today uh, at the Politburo Standing Committee level, um, you had sort of, you know, you now have basically provincial officials with not, you know, especially high levels of education. You know, I think a couple of them have like these MBA type degrees that, you know, in, in China, you know, especially mid-career degrees in China, they're, they're not especially meaningful, unlike the Booth School, of course, where, where there's top-notch uh, mid-career education going on. Um, in the Politburo level, uh, as you mentioned, um, you, you have very interesting patterns. So uh, you do have these uh, people, Ma Xingrui uh, and Yuan Jiajun, you know, coming from the aeronautical defense industry with engineering degrees. Um, you know, but but for me, I don't think they were chosen because of their knowledge base necessarily, because they're they're going to serve as provincial officials. You know, they're not. You know, running uh, maybe one of them, like this guy Zhang Guoqing, may become a vice premier who's in charge of industry, you know, or something like that. 
Uh, but Ma, Ma Xingwei, for example, aeronautical engineer, he's running Xinjiang, <laughs> you know. Um, I, I think their selection has more to do with this political dynamic, which I outline in my new book, Coalition of the Week, which is that people from state-owned enterprises, they tend to have smaller political networks because companies are more insulated, whereas officials who come out of uh, especially major provinces, they have larger political networks because a province is very complicated. Provincial officials, they get rotated around within the province, sometimes even across provinces. Uh, and the bulk of the political elite in China are still provincial officials. So if you come from provinces, you have larger networks. If you come from SOEs, you have smaller networks. So I think that may be the main consideration instead of their expertise. The other group um, is very interesting. You have these uh, theoreticians from the central party school who are um, doing pretty well. Um, you have uh, Li Shulei being the prime example. Uh, and Li Shulei is like this well-known intellectual, uh, Shen Tong, you know, a genius, you know, kind of Du Yi Hauser of China, uh, except not medical sciences, but like classical Chinese literature or something like that. Um, but, you know, supposedly the author of a lot of this the current push for to emphasize Chinese traditional culture, the importance of it in the development of culture in China in the future. Uh, so I think he will be a pretty major intellectual force in the party going forward, um, but no economics expertise. Right. So there's there's a lot of national security type thinkers, you know, Zhang Yaoxia and Wang Huning. Um, you know, you have uh, a lot of ideological experts, uh, even people who are not, their jobs are not ideology, they started with doing a lot of ideology, like Chen Minar, Huang Kunming, um, but not a lot of economics expertise. So, so I, I do think that is worrisome, actually. Meg, Victor's painted a uh, pretty complete picture of, of the current state of the Politburo. We have a lot of people who sort of have backgrounds in national security and ideology. Could you, you know, Deng Xiaoping famously said to get rich is glorious. Is that still the case in China? And could you talk a little bit about the way the relationship between big business and the state is evolving now in Seize China? Sure. So that's the book I just finished. <laughs> Which Victor's book is already out. Mine will be out next year. But um, yeah, so I mean, of course, you know, that we don't see a lot of emphasis. And it seems like obviously Li Qiang will be the prime minister um, or the premier rather and, and, and in charge of the economy. And it's not clear, you know, what that will look like. Um, you know, I think there's no daylight between him and the rest of the Politburo Standing Committee and between him and Xi Jinping. And so um, we're likely to see, you know, a, a continuation of what we had. And and it's really, I mean, it's interesting, you know, Wang Huning's focus is really on you have to have a strong state at this stage because, you know, the obsession is that the United States is going to not let China grow, et cetera. And so the solution to everything is national security. And this, it's a kind of we're in this world where the obsession with national security is generating a lot of problems for the economy. And then also the solution is national security. And so I just don't, I don't see any of this changing in the short term. Um, in terms of mi big business, um, it's, it's a really interesting uh, mixed bag because we have this central puzzle, right, which is that all of these, you know, big businesses, you know, Jack Ma is obviously a very famous party member, right? We know all of these people, all of these businesses that have gone down in the last several years, right, Ambang or H&A, right, a lot of these firms, even Evergrande, right, all of these tycoons are very close to members of the party. And then suddenly, right, we find, you know, that their, their, their assets are being um, expropriated by the state, or they're putting in, in prison, or et cetera, et cetera. And so, um, so, you know, what really, what really is happening, and what really did happen? Um, and I think the sense from, from Xi Jinping and from others, right, is that, you know, that basically the cozy state business relations and the corruption that we saw was generating a lot of financial instability in China. And in a sense, he, he's not wrong, right? That perspective isn't wrong. I mean, when you look at the, the composition and the structure of some of these um, large corporates in China, um, I mean, they really defy logic, like how they're moving assets around. You know, there's these small listed companies which are tenuously connected to the larger firm. They're doing what economists call tunneling assets, expropriating minority shareholders, right? Let, you know, borrowing from banks and then turning their renminbi into euros and U.S. dollars by investing them abroad, you know, which is generating all kinds of financial insecurity for China. 
um, over this period of time, really between 2010 and 2016, 2017, when we start to see, 2017 was um, when Xi Jinping started to crack down on the gray rhinos, right? These large indebted firms. Um, and so an unwinding of that. And so some of these firms have been able to unwind their overseas investments and unwind some of their debt. So Fosun, for example, or Dali and Wanda, has, had, they've kind of soldiered on in, in a different thing, where in a different form, whereas you see companies like Anbang and h and um, meeting much harsher fates, really. Um, their, their founders you know, being imprisoned, et cetera, and their, their assets being broken up or nationalized by the state. And so a lot of, I think, what's happening is a sorting out of, um, of which of these kinds of large diversified conglomerates can be trusted and which ones can't be trusted and which ones can be disciplined and which ones can't be disciplined. But, but I, I would say it's not wrong, right, that a lot of these businesses were sort of, you know, running schemes that have been pretty destructive for the Chinese economy over the long term. Then you get to this other, so that's one set of big business, which is these large diversified private conglomerations and then, um, or conglomerates. And then you get, you know, the others, which are the large tech firms. And so, you know, many people are, uh, when we ask ourselves, you know, what happened, right, to Alipay? What happened to Ant Financial and the IPO? And the obsession has been on, it's Jack Ma's speech. It's a speech where he, you know, poked fun at the regulators and it's a political crackdown. It's not really my view that that's the case, right? Um, it really is an interesting, and I think there's a lot of comparison to be done between, for example, <laughs> you know, the US and Europe and China and how they're thinking about these big fintech firms, especially, right? Because ultimately um, Ant was IPOing as if it were as an app, right? A platform, right? A tech firm, but it's a bank. It's a bank um, that, it, you know, has a tremendous financial exposure in China that holds a lot of savings of every household in China. And the CCP doesn't really know how to deal with that and think about that risk, right? So the, the risk management approach which I think characterizes the kind of model that we're in right now with China. It's all about risk management rather than accepting some risk in exchange for economic growth. It's that very, very low tolerance for risk, right? And that goes to how you think about regulating big tech, how you think about regulating these large platform companies. Um, and so, you know, China being China, you know, they, they crack down on it, right? Restructure it, fine it, figure out what to do, right? We're hemming and hawing in the United States about what to do about, you know, Amazon, what to do about these other firms. Um, whereas in China, they're taking this other approach. But I would like to encourage people to see that not necessarily as super ideological or as political punishment, but as a, a regulatory process where the CCP is trying to sort out what to do with that. Um, so then, you know, what do you get in the long term? <laughs> you know, are they going to be willing to make these compromises or not? So before the, the 20th, you know, we saw some of these meetings with Li Keqiang meeting with some of the tech people saying, okay, well, maybe we need to liberalize a little bit in order to get innovation and investment. And so with this current slate of leaders, I don't see those kinds of meetings going, going that well, even in suggestion anymore. Um, but, you know, then, and someone asked a question in the, in the Q&A, like, how long can that go on, right? How long can we go on with a, a, a very, very low or no growth um, Chinese economy before this dance of, you know, what I call in my work, accommodation and reprisal. So over the last seven years, really, it's been, okay, well, we want to crack down on the private sector, but then we realize we need to accommodate them pragmatically to get some of what we need. And so, you know, I, I, I would never say permanently we're at the absolute end of this era, right? It's just a, a pretty deep, um, you know, kind of wave of, of reprisal. Um, but I, I would say accommodation might come eventually, although I, I see some of what's happening under C, um, locking in a kind of punitive economic model that, that's going to be really hard to unwind. Like, what do you do? Reverse these laws, right? Do you unwind state financial positions? That's all really hard to do. So these sets of reforms would be, I think, more difficult than those in the past. I just want to pick up off one thing you said, and, and I'd be keen for your views and then also Victor's views. You know, I've, I've read some commentary that um, America, as you were saying, is really grappling with how to deal with its own, you know, with Amazon and Google and, and other big tech companies and like, oh, look, China's just um, trying to do what's best for Chinese consumers and, you know, isn't common prosperity a good thing and shouldn't we be spreading the wealth around? Uh, Meg, what, what what do you think of that kind of analysis? And then then I'd be keen for Victor's follow up. Well, if you're asking me my views on redistribution, I will have to pass. <laughs> um, but uh, but you know, I think I mean one thing that's very interesting. I mean, China has become a highly unequal society, right? We've seen, and the frustration, right, that households have over things like. You know, for example, you know, the, the ed tech sector, which we saw a huge crackdown on the ed tech sector 
you know, where they, I mean, essentially China's eliminated the sector, right, by instituting price controls. And then, you know, the, the, the most of these firms that have been doing tutoring are wiped out, right? The sector is done. Um, and why did the sector exist? Well, there are competitive family dynamics and people feel the need to go over the top and do all of this, right? They're, so they're frustrated by having to spend all their income doing that. Um, and they're also frustrated, right, that now they don't have the ability to do that. So they're sort of stuck in this position. So, I mean, I, I think genuinely there is an element of what they're trying to do, which is to meet the frustrations of Chinese society halfway. Um, I just, I mean, I think once that's matched with other things like extensive lockdowns and the absolute you know, inability of people to express their views, right? And even just like send WeChat messages to one another. I mean, people are really frustrated from my, you know, we know much less from a big data standpoint in terms of what we used to know from public opinion and things like that that we know now. But, um, but you know, but I, but I, I really, my emphasis has always been, or recently has been, that it's a lot less ideological what's going on in China than it is about control. So it's really about discipline rather rather than about, I mean, common prosperity is much less important than the party controls all things. And so basically it's much more about we need to control and discipline and manage risk and a lot less about we need to redistribute and that it's, you know, it's really an ideological resurgence in China. I really see this as much more about politics and control. Yeah, I, I think when we talk about ideology in China, it's more like Xi Jinping's ideo ideology is like the party is pretty awesome rather than he has like a very coherent ideological worldview like Marx. Uh, I don't know, though, Victor, what do you think about um, what Meg was just saying about ideology uh, and, and also the extent to which um, the crackdown on, on China's big big tech firms are sort of is is the Chinese government trying to grapple with challenges that face governments all over the world and and uh, them trying to sort of make China a fairer society. Uh, yeah, no, I, I completely agree with Meg that it's really about control. I mean, I guess the only role ideology can play is that, you know, we know Xi Jinping himself is affected by ideology from his youth, uh, which which is to say Maoist ideology quite a bit. And so to the extent that, you know, that kind of outlook will color his policy making, um, then obviously if he makes a policy, then the entire bureaucracy uh, has to carry it out. Uh, so there is this kind of indirect feed through uh, of ideology. Um, I think the way that the interaction between government and the tech sector differs between the US, let's say, um, and even Europe uh, and China is that, um, you know, even in China, you know, so when I was doing a lot of field work in the 2000s uh, in the financial sector, for example, there was um, regular dialogue between the regulators, financial regulators and banks, and not just the state-owned banks, uh, also the foreign-owned banks uh, so a couple of the privately owned banks in China, um, and they would listen, they genuinely would listen to what these banks were telling the regulators and then kind of incorporate that into their regulatory decision making. Uh, in cybersecurity, especially after the formation of the leading group and now Commission on Informationalization and Cybersecurity, uh, it seems like it's, um, you know, kind of regulatory action is very much a one-way dialogue, you know, with the government basically telling the entire tech sector, do this, don't do that. Uh, they still have meetings, uh, but the some of the accounts that I've read about these meetings is very much a one-way, you know, conversation uh, instead of a, a genuine dialogue where they will take um, some of the input from industry and try to incorporate some of these recommendations into uh, the regulations. Uh, you know, I think tech companies um, in the U.S. just like well, maybe except maybe except for Twitter. You know, tomorrow <laughs> we'll see what happens to Twitter tomorrow uh, when it formally goes in the hand of Elon Musk. But but I think you know, tech companies generally speaking, they also know that there's always possibility of the regulatory hammer falling on them. So it is in their interest to have a conversation with the regulators um, so that they can try to convince uh, the regulators of their perspective, but then also um, get information about uh, forthcoming regulatory action so that they're not completely surprised by it. Uh, the problem in China is that this kind of conversation uh, is not uh, 
as readily available as in the case of some of these other countries. Thanks, Victor. I want to open to Q&A now. I see some really, really great questions coming in. So please, uh, everyone, feel free to drop your questions for Meg and Victor into the chat. I see there's a couple of people who are really curious about China's zero COVID policies. Victor, you were just talking about how, you know, it's more of a one way uh, dialogue right now, a top down approach in China. Uh, I guess I'll, I'll I'll throw this question to both of you, maybe Meg first. Um, how long will zero COVID likely continue? Maybe that's an unanswerable question, but do you have any frameworks for how we should be thinking about China's zero COVID policy? I mean, we saw the speech, which was very much a uh, look, you know, zero COVID is here to stay, right? Is what he said at the 20th and that, you know, putting lives before all of the things. So the more that that language is embraced, the harder it is, right, to shift that particular model. And so, I mean, I think what they've learned over the last year, right, is that they can lock down Shanghai for a long period of time and people aren't happy, but no one does anything about it, right? They can do it. Um, they can do it. And so, um, you know, it used to be, you know, we were thinking maybe after this meeting, now people are saying maybe after March, right? Um, that they'll, they'll open back up. But something, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I'm super curious to hear what you and Victor think, or how can we know, but something would have to change, right? So either the material conditions will have to change such that maybe China starts distributing mRNA vaccines, right, somehow, or maybe they're, and there's a vaccine hesitancy in China that's really quite profound, right? So either something has to change with like the virus itself, that I am definitely not qualified to discuss, right? Or it has to change with the vaccination or you know, the way that they're dealing with it, or there has to be a change in the way they talk and think about it. And that second thing, I see no evidence of that in the short term. And so if, we, if we're still in April and they're still in zero COVID, like, wow, it feels like we're really stuck. But that's all I've got for you. I, I'm super curious to hear what the two of you think. No, I think you're right that we have no evidence and, and just sort of picking up off that point, the fact that Li Qiang got promoted is sending a, a very, very different signal. Victor, could you maybe talk a bit about, um, you know, I think in, in sort of more, um, liberal circles in the West, you know, people look at Shanghai and are like, what a disaster, like Li Chung would definitely be punished. And from Xi Jinping's perspective, he's taken a very different, he has a very different conclusion. Li Chung has like held the line. Uh, could you talk a bit about, you know, from Xi's perspective, what what might he have made of Li Chung's performance during the Shanghai lockdown? And, and you know, what lessons can we draw from that about being an official in Xi Jinping's China? Well, I mean, that's just evidence that performance doesn't really matter in the Chinese government, which is what I've been saying for, you know, 20 years. So so I'm I'm fine with saying that. Uh, but no, no, uh, you know, obviously, you know, uh, Xi Jinping must have gotten some reports of what transpired in, in Shanghai. Uh, but I think this switch in COVID policy in Shanghai initially going with more flexible kind of lockdown and then um, late on transitioning to full lockdown, uh, that must have been approved by higher level authorities. So the leading group on um, fighting COVID, uh, someone told me that is still in existence and Xi Jinping himself leads it. Uh, so a big decision like first going with dynamic uh, lockdown and then later on to full lockdown should have been approved by higher level authorities. And if that's the case, then Li Chang is not responsible for the kind of um, infection outcomes of these policies. Uh, there clearly was some problem in logistics, right? So not delivering food to all the neighborhoods of Shanghai. Um, but apparently that has not affected his career. Or maybe he, you know, a couple of district chiefs in Shanghai were removed. So I think the logistical issues were just blame on these district level officials. Um, but, you know, so it shows really what what happened in Shanghai could have been an excuse to uh, delay the promotion of Li Chang if his ties with Xi Jinping were not so strong. But apparently it's very strong and it didn't really impact it at all. I mean, for that matter, Tai Chi, right? So this banner 
that unfurled uh, in the middle of Beijing two days before the Congress, that can be seen as a huge policy failure of the Beijing municipal government. Uh, but apparently it didn't affect Tai Chi's promotion. And I guess related to zero COVID, you know, the, the sort of slowdown in the Chinese economy is, is intimately connected with China's zero COVID policy. I see a question from JP Wang in the chat. Um, given China's economy is no longer growing as fast as it was, how long might it be before it crashes? Isn't it crashing already? Oh, Meg, why, why don't you, you, you talk to rich people, they tend to know what, what's happening. I used to talk to rich people. They don't really want to talk anymore. Um, so what's interesting is that we love, so my first book was on real estate in China. And so for how long now, 10, 12 years, right? I've been answering the question, when will the real estate bubble burst, right? And so we tend to think of, you know, when will things crash or burst, right? And so thinking just about Evergrande this time last year, right? The questions were, is this China's Lehman moment, right? And so we expect these like explosive and contagious dynamics within the Chinese economy. We never get them, right? What we always get is like a slow burn, a slow, you know, unwinding of things that is just kind of taking misallocated resources and then and, and misallocating them in a different direction, right? And so, um, so I, I don't think that we'll see crash, right? When you see, so the book I just finished compares China also to Malaysia and Indonesia. So Indonesia during the Asian financial crisis, that was crash, right? That was crash. And obviously Suharto paid the, paid the price for it, right? It brought the regime down in its own way. Um, in China, we don't see that because the regime has not been open, right? There's these capital controls have existed in China for a long period of time, right? So there can't be these kind of extremely rapid dynamics of a crash in the renminbi, right? And we still have a Chinese Communist Party, which for better or for worse, mostly for worse, they fundamentally control input like factor prices, right, in China. So they have control over supply and demand of land, right? And through through quotas and through the way that, you know, land is, is sold and bought in China and auctioned, right, and released. Um, the hukou, right, the, um, the passport system controls where labor goes, right? So they can control labor in China and they definitely control the price of capital through an extensive state-owned bank system and, you know, state shareholding now, which, you know, now we have minority shares in um, many, many, if not the majority of listed or definitely the plurality of listed firms in China. And so, um, you know, so it's a really, it's a different system, right? And it's not prone to this crash, but is it, you know, what, what I'm seeing right now looks like as crashy as we get in China, right? So, I mean, extremely low growth, households that are deeply concerned about the future and therefore are inclined to save more rather than spend, businesses that are refusing to invest, right? Debt problems that are just insurmountable, right? So, I mean, corporate debt that it, we have no idea how it's going to unwind, right? Local government debt, we have no idea how it's going to unwind and considerable debt, dollar denominated debt out in the world that's on the balance sheet of Chinese development banks. Um, and we have no idea how that's going to unwind. And so, you know, I don't see there's going to be some moment where we see like boom, crash, Lehman moment. It's much more, I think, the Japanese kind of model, which is uh, but what what I think a lot worse than what happened in Japan, right, which is like very, very low or zero or stagnant growth, right, um, a deep unwinding and what will materially be kind of a loss of a lowering of living standards, right, within Chinese cities, which relatively speaking, I mean, their living standards have been lowered through COVID and zero COVID policies over the last two years already, right? So if their living standards are lowered through not being able to spend as much, right, because we're seeing a debt crisis unwind really slowly, I'm not sure that that'll be as politically as explosive as people might think it will be. Um, but, you know, it's just, it's not a normal political economy, right? It's difficult to compare it to other places because the, the, the control the state has over prices um, is just unprecedented. So, um, but but I'd love to hear what Victor and and what you, Sulin, have to say about. No, I well, mean, uh, within uh, mainland China, I agree with that. I mean, the Chinese government controls, you know, input output, even labor allocation. So right now they're doing this really crazy thing where um, you, you basically have these local government companies. Uh, some part of it would be selling land, but then another part of it would get a bank loan and buy the land. 
right? So they basically just buy the land from themselves. And then you're like, well, what's the point of that? The point of that is that the buying entity is using a bank loan to buy it. Uh, whereas the selling entity can take that money and just count it as government revenue. And that's a way basically to have the banks lend money to local governments for expenditure because at the local level, uh, many local governments have just run out of money. And the central government is not giving them enough money to pay for ordinary expenses uh, like fighting COVID, like stability maintenance. I mean, these are very expensive uh, expenditure categories. Um, so I think this kind of drying up of local fiscal resources is a point of potential. Yeah, so I agree with you, Meg. It's like, well, it's slow burn. You know, everything's under control and all this stuff. But I do see a few uh, weak points where you could see some, uh, you know, disjuncture or discontinuous uh, development happening. One is uh, local fiscal the local fiscal situation. I mean, it, it just get worse and worse and worse. And then you're like, oh my God, how can it get any worse? It gets worse again, but then everything's fine. And, you know, everything keeps going. Um, but I, I do think, I mean, it's like stretching a rubber band. I mean, at some point it's going to snap. We just don't know. I mean, the other uh, discontinuity that I can see is in foreign exchange. Uh, so as you know, you know, past couple of years, China built up a uh, you know, more foreign exchange and hit some of it off of the safes balance sheet and all that kind of stuff. Now it's all come back down. It's at 3 trillion. Um, because the money supply is so large and because U.S. interest rates are now higher than Chinese interest rates, there's just a lot of temptation and incentives to move money offshore. Uh, and there are still some loopholes uh, and money is leaving, right? So, you know, otherwise, why would the FX reserve still decrease when there's trade surplus? Uh, there clearly are these pretty big loopholes. Um, and basically, at a certain point, if enough money has left China and, and if the FX reserve has shrunken enough, the Chinese government will have to float the currency. You know, it's kind of what Russia did a couple of times. Uh, and that's going to be, you know, uh, cause a lot of turmoil, basically. So, so I do see, I mean, overall, I, I think you're right. Most of everything is under control, but there are some weak points for sure. Yeah, I agree with the external balances issue, actually, um, that, you know, they can only, and I, I, I watch that capital flow data all the time, right? And it's amazing. And so, um, but yeah, there's nothing they can do about that. And it's amazing. I mean, even in 2017, the line was Baosan, Baosan, you know, protect three trillion. And so they're still doing that and they're fighting really hard. And so, especially as you see more foreign direct investment withdraw, um, you know, to deal with supply chain issues and comply with decoupling measures from the U.S. I think the external balances issue is the big issue, but domestically, I tend to think they might be able to manage some really slow growth with politi without political consequences. Meg, Victor has uh, said you've, you've talked to rich people in China or uh, abroad quite a bit. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, what's on their mind right now? They want to know how to get their money out of China. They want to know how to get uh, citizenship elsewhere. Um, I mean, it, you know, I don't know. I, it's not as if I have a WeChat group that's like all of the Huarun billionaires or something. <laughs> that's not really um, what I do. But, you know, um, and I, I want to be careful not to you know, seem like I'm naming any names. But but really, but this that anxiety is not new. That anxiety has been there for some period of time, right? Um, and it's, I mean, you know, for a long period of time, actually. Um, and so, uh, and, and that, and I think it comes from a fundamental distrust of the regime, which is pretty historical. So this pattern I described of accommodation and reprisal, that's nothing new, right? Um, about how entrepreneurs have been treated in China. And so they're used to weathering those things. Um, but yeah, people are feeling really, really nervous um, and really unhappy. But, you know, they also understand that there may be, another period where they would be doing better right and that prize is a pretty big prize and so um so i guess you know what's been really surprising to me to be honest is the kind of equanimity of people when they talk about it i don't know what you've been experiencing but when i talk to people you know and of course i haven't been to china since january 2020 so it's not as if i'm like walking around shanghai doing field work right but 
Um, but when I do talk to people who visit or, you know, I'm able to connect with electronically, they're like, yeah, it's a pretty bad time. You know, it's not, it's, they, they don't feel like it's a sense of emergency. Whereas, you know, politically, I, I feel like my country is in a sense of emergency, right, about its political system and various other things. And so you just kind of get this weird acceptance of, of what's going on in China. Even, you know, I've had, I had someone say, well, you know, my generation might be a little bit lost now. No, we'll see. <laughs> it's sort of so the but and I think I think what that really reveals is a sense of inefficacy right um so there's nothing I can do about it and so I was I was interested in you know listening to both of you talk about the Hu Jintao episode because of course that's what it means right politically there's just no counter to Xi Jinping there doesn't seem to be any alternative any debate any possibility of and so I think a lot of people just feel a, a sense of efficacy lost and so dissatisfaction is dissatisfaction they can get as much money out as they possibly can but um, but they can't do anything about China's direction. And so, um, so that's my, my initial reflection. I'm seeing lots of questions in the chat about Taiwan and I'm conscious of our time. So I think that might be uh, where we end the discussion. But before I do, I'm not sure if this is a stepping stone or if this is, you know, from your Megan Victor's perspectives, kind of irrelevant. I was wondering if you could both briefly reflect on, you know, the recent um, policies we've seen coming out of America regarding high-end semiconductors and Chinese companies' ability to access the, those high-end semiconductors or, you know, shutting off uh, Chinese companies' ability to access those high-end semiconductors. Uh, how significant is this and, and what might some of the implications be, Victor? Yeah, no, I was a bit shocked myself uh, when the when the policies came out because it's very draconian. U.S. citizens cannot work in or for um, any Chinese semiconductor companies. Um, so then, you know, I talked to some people in the industry and stuff like that. Uh, and apparently the problem is that, you know, at first the U.S. is like, oh, you can't sell chips to certain, you know, Chinese companies. But then um, some of these Chinese companies just paid more and got around this issue by saying that, OK, you know, you can't sell us your technology, but how about we rent your engineers like a service, right? So you just send your engineers to these Chinese companies. They can work here and then help us produce what we need to produce, and then we'll pay you a huge amount of money. So they did that for a while. And, it, you know, for some of this technology, indeed, it worked out, you know, because you know, it's really all about the brain power, and you can kind of like lease the talent, so to speak, from the United States. Uh, but then I was like, well, why can't you just target the companies that are doing that, you know, but then they're like, well, you can have a list, you can say like, okay, these two companies can't rent their engineers to China anymore, but then they can just set up like shell companies to keep doing it, you know, basically. So then that's, that's how they ultimately arrived to like a blanket ban. Um, yeah, no, it's it's unfortunate. I mean, I guess the only solace I, I have now is kind of like at least is just in semiconductor and AI, which is very, AI is more, you know, hard to define, you know, sectors like what is an AI these days, right? So, so that could, that in the medium term could have a much larger impact. Uh, and then it just adds to barriers to, uh, intellectual exchange uh, between the two countries, which which I do find unfortunate. Meg, what do you make of the recent announcements about high-end semiconductors? Yeah, so, um, yeah, so I, you know, my initial thoughts, I was also surprised at how sweeping the policies were, um, and, my, and I initially thought um, maybe they were too sweeping, actually. And so, you know, this dynamic I described earlier at the top of the um, the program on the security dilemma dynamic, which is like, you know, China saying, we need to be self-reliant because we can't trust the West, they'll weaponize it. And then China does things and then we respond by weaponizing it. And then China does other things and says, we have to be self-reliant and then we weaponize it again. And so we keep pushing them into these, these behaviors, although there are many behaviors that they took on of their own volition, right? And so, um, you know, as a, you know, as a political scientist, I'm having greater appreciation for the tragedy of the security dilemma and great power politics. Like I used to think, you know, all this stuff was a bit overblown. And now I just feel like I'm watching a lot of it play out in terms of, you know, the tragedy of it. On the other hand, um, you know, it does seem to me um, that the U.S. and other countries are in a position where they will not tolerate um, China's dominance in high-end 
tech sectors, right? And, um, you know, and AI, you know, is, is, a, is one thing because, and I, you know, I would point to the work of my colleague, David Yang and the economics department here at Harvard. I think the policy thinking is that there's basically no way to stop China and AI um, because they're just gonna have richness of data um, and an exchange of data between, I mean, on facial recognition on all things, right? We have privacy laws in the US, we're not gonna have that, that, that richness of data. And so there's just no way to stop them with that. And so if you can't stop them in AI, then you just can't have China also winning in quantum um, because the combination of those two things would make it really difficult, right? Um, in the event of, a, a, of, of any kind of conflict between the United States and China, um, and so um, in that sense, what we're seeing basically is a complete lack of trust that any firms in China, you know, are not connected to the Chinese state or that um, that China's technological advancement is definitely such a threat to the United States that this kind of Herculean stuff has to happen. And, um, you know, it's interesting from a variety of standpoints, we're also probably going to get an outbound investment review mechanism in the United States, which is really quite an amazing situation, right, when you think about the United States as the architect allegedly of global capitalism and free capital flows. And now we're gonna get you know, something that puts capital controls and capital reviews on American firms. And so this kind of, the dynamic between the US and China is really reshaping capitalism overall in a way that is, that is really quite profound. And so, um, so I, I find it all interesting. I, I guess I, I'm, I'm unwilling to criticize it in a way I, I, I initially was. I feel like I've been corrected a little bit and, um, and, and, I, and I do see the sense in it, um, but is it likely to have a huge effect on China? Tremendous, right? Um, I mean, it's, it's gonna be really a big deal. And you know, whether they are able to be self-reliant overall in the end, I'm, I'm not sure. And a lot of that will relate to Taiwan, <laughs> the relationships between Taiwan. And so um, it is a, it's very messy. It's a very big mess. Speaking of big messes, uh, I, I wanna end the, webinar on this question of Taiwan. Uh, maybe I'll first turn to Victor and then give Meg the last word. Victor, how are you thinking about the Taiwan question? You know, do you think there is a chance of military invasion? Are there other ways that China is trying to squeeze Taiwan? Could you give us sort of a broad overview of your thoughts on Taiwan, please? Yeah, it's really hard to think about Taiwan because um, there's really no rational reason for Xi Jinping to want to militarily invade Taiwan. Um, politically, he doesn't need it. You know, he's, he's the most powerful person in China. No one can challenge his authorities. Because, uh, you know, sometimes leaders will go to war in order to jump up, you know, domestic support and, and so on and so forth. That is clearly not the case here. Economically, I can only see huge downsides and absolutely no upside whatsoever. Um, but we just don't know how much he intrinsically wants it. You know, uh, and of course, he has said that he does intrinsically want it, you know, because in order to have this great rejuvenation of China, how can you not have unification? Um, of course, and the speech uh, at the Congress, he still said, oh, to the extent possible, we still will seek uh, peaceful reunification, which is the same wording as before. Uh, but the lineup of the leadership actually does worry me a little bit. You know, he has people whom he trusts a great deal dominating Politburo Standing Committee. And then in the Central Military Commission, of course, uh, Zhang Yuxia, a person, one of the few senior officers with actual combat experience, uh, a very close friend of Xi Jinping. And then He Weidong uh, was, uh, knew Xi Jinping very well from their days in Fujian, but also a senior officer in the 31st Group Army, which is the frontline army vis-a-vis uh, -vis Taiwan, across the Taiwan Strait. Um, so it does look a little bit like some of the ducks are being put in a row, but whether he pulls the trigger or not, it's just very hard to analyze because ultimately it comes down to his personal preference. That's Meg. awful. Um, I mean, I think my 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 bleak view is that um, I think what happened with Russia in in February between Xi Jinping and Putin was an intelligence failure in China. That um, in fact, you know, 
it's quite, and Putin, I think, played him like a fiddle, right, to declare no limits of the friendship. And then I, I don't think, I don't think Xi Jinping really knew that he was planning to, to try to occupy and annex all of Ukraine. Um, and so that is a very bad sign. And now we're in a world where, I mean, the one thing we know, right, is that people make bad decisions when they're surrounded with loyalists who don't disagree with them. And we're not sure that, you know, Xi Jinping's, you know, Politburo Standing Committee won't disagree with them. Maybe they'll full license to, we don't know, right? But, um, but if it's more intelligence, and Putin has been, you know, a victim of this kind of too, right? You get, you get so enmeshed and you get so insulated that you make terrible decisions. And so, um, so, you know, whether he wants it and then he might want it and he might think he can have it, which is a very dangerous combination. And so, um, so we'll see, but um, I don't see anything in the very short term, but I worry about 2027. I worry about 2032. I just, I worry a lot. Um, and I worry about this, the US side as well. Like what kinds of things can happen here? So um, I'm sorry, it's very bleak and very uncertain. No, no, it's, uh, I think a real, that's a very realistic picture that both you and, and Victor have painted today. Uh, so I'd just like to thank Meg and Victor for their world-class expertise and being able to talk about so many different topics, sort of all the implications that flow from what it means now that there are so many loyalists at the very, very top of the party, what that means for the Chinese economy, what that might mean for Taiwan, all the big messes and uncertainties and unknowability that that, that all raises. And also a huge thank you to the Stigler Center and the University of Chicago for hosting us. I hope that you have enjoyed this webinar as much as I have. So thank you once again to Megan Victor.